Hello, I'm Yalda Hakim. Our top story on impact today, could Google's search engine be returning to China and the 1.4 billion people who live there? The reports are conflicting, but suggestions are that the company will develop a version that will conform to strict censorship laws. A presidential call for calm in Zimbabwe after troops opened fire on crowds who were protesting against the victory of the governing party in parliamentary elections. And it's two years away, but that's a short time when you're running for U.S. president as Democrats strive for a comeback. We look at potential candidates gathering in New Orleans. That's all coming up here on Impact. Welcome back. Eight years after Google pulled its search engine out of China, there are reports the company is planning to make a comeback, comeback rather there. It's apparently considering a version which would censor search terms in accordance with China's restrictions on freedom of speech. The project, codenamed Dragonfly, has reportedly been underway since last year. Robin Brandt has more from Shanghai. Google is not in China, uh, certainly not in the way it has that ubiquitous presence across the rest of the world. Uh, Google's search engine was pulled out of the mainland in 2010, and that's because the company said it no longer could abide by the censorship laws put in place by the government here, which restricts what people can search for on the Internet. It does have a presence in terms of its translation apps. It has a presence more recently in terms of developing some gaming and also investing in artificial intelligence. It opened some innovation labs in Beijing uh, earlier this year. And that's led to increased rumors that it does want to get back uh, into search uh, in this country. And you can see the business case for that, even if you won't accept the ethical or moral case. 1.4 billion people here. Uh, you have Microsoft, a presence here, Apple as well, also Facebook uh, knocking on the door. So we have reports that uh, Google is looking at developing both a search app and also a newsfeed app, both of which would abide by the censorship uh, laws in this country. Now, there's no official word uh, from Google. The official word from uh, some of the state-backed media here is that, in fact, it is not true. Uh, the Securities Daily is reporting that uh, these reports don't conform with reality, and it's not true Google is to return to the mainland. If it was, it's not a given that suddenly it can pick up where it left off eight years ago and dominate the search market here. Baidu, a huge player in the domestic market, dominates uh, at the moment. And I think if uh, Google were to return in, search of, uh, in terms of search, it would be a very challenging environment. Robin Brandt reporting there from Shanghai. Well, earlier I spoke to Ryan Gallagher, an investigative reporter from the news website The Intercept, who first reported the story. I asked him how he gained access to the internal documents. Have a listen. Um, well, without going into too much detail for, for obvious reasons, um, these documents were shown to me by individuals who were concerned about the project uh, within Google. and have decided to make them public in the public interest because obviously this is a matter of great concern to well not just people in China but people all around the world who care about uh, freedom of information and an open internet. Um, Google have responded they basically said we don't comment on speculation about future plans but if this does go ahead I mean this would be a dramatic shift for Google. That's right, yeah, because um, between 2006 and 2010, Google actually did uh, previously operate a censored search engine in China, but pulled out of the country, citing concerns about free speech, about um, government hacking Google systems and all kinds of things. Uh, the the co-founder of Google, Sergey Brin, he even commented about... Um, forces of totalitarianism in China that they were concerned about and they wanted to leave for that reason. So now, eight years on, this is a stunning reversal in terms of Google's uh, policy. And um, it's quite remarkable to me, actually, and I've still not had it explained fully to me by anyone why exactly uh, Google wants to go back in and how the concerns they had in 2010 no longer apply. Uh, because, of course, uh, there are many who are raising moral and ethical concerns. I mean, human rights groups are saying this is a dark day for the information age. What's been some of the other reaction? 
Well, as you said, I mean, the, the human rights groups in particular have been very strong on it because this is a big issue for them in terms of censoring. You know, we're not just talking about information related to, to human rights. We're talking about anything to do really with democracy, pro-democracy, activism, um, you know, information about dissidents, information about opposition politicians, even information about sex and things like that would be censored um, under this. So the, the human rights groups are very concerned about it for those reasons. Um, but we have, you know, there's a, quite a prominent um, senator in the United States, Marco Rubio, who was one of the presidential candidates in 2016. He's commented on it. He says the, the report that we put out is a very disturbing um, so I expect that probably on a political level there's going to be some backlash here as well we're going to see some um, demands for Google to provide information about what they're doing that was Ryan Gallagher investigative reporter from The Intercept now to the rest of the day's news there has been absolutely no skullduggery in Zimbabwe's elections that's the verdict of the country's electoral commission as the country awaits to hear who has won the presidential vote that we're told will start to be announced very soon but tensions are high in the country three people were shot dead by security forces during protests after the governing ZANU PF party were declared winners of the parliamentary elections. Observers have already said excessive force was used. Our correspondent Norm Maseko is in Harare and she gave you this update. Today here in the streets of Harare it's very quiet but there is still a military and the police presence following those skirmishes that we saw yesterday that led to the death of uh, three people and uh, many more others have been wounded and we heard from uh, the uh, electoral commission about two hours ago in which they uh, said that they were still busy with the counting and verification process of the election results to, for, for Zimbabweans to find out who the president uh, will be for uh, uh, next time but at the moment no results have uh, been announced and there is still going to be another a further press briefing in the next few hours where they will give an indication when they will be ready to make an announcement uh, and of course it's the um, opposition MDC uh, party and their supporters who believe that this vote uh, was rigged um, but the Electoral Commission has said they're not deliberately withholding uh, information they're just following a process Indeed, uh, the Electoral Commission even going further to say that uh, this election has seen an unprecedented number of presidential hopefuls. 23 uh, people have uh, uh, ambitions to be the president of this country, 19 men and 4 women. And they are also saying that is the reason why there is such a delay, because they are also waiting for the legal representatives of those uh, 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 presidential hopefuls to verify those results, to also say that that they are satisfied with what the announcement will be. We don't know when that announcement will be, but from what we hear uh, uh, from the Electoral Commission is that they are still well within the rights uh, and the law to, to, to withhold even those uh, election results because they say they have five days in which to do so after the election. Of course, we heard also from uh, in, uh, international observers who condemned the violence that we saw on the streets of Harare and we are also expecting a press briefing by uh, members of the ZANU PF party who say that they want to give an update on the security situation of the country. I'm Sir Maseko reporting there from Harare. Now to other stories making headlines here on Impact. A high-ranking Chinese monk has denied accusations. He sexually harassed nuns and coerced them into sex by controlling their minds. The accusations against Abbot Xu Chung were in a report sent to government officials by two monks from the Beijing temple where he's based. He's the latest public figure to be accused of sexual misconduct in China. The Abbot's temple has stressed his denial of the charges but has also called for an investigation. An Australian senator has sued a male opponent for defamation for making sexually offensive remarks in a landmark case. Sarah Hansen Young alleges Senator David Leyenhelm heckled her and made def defamatory statements about her personal life during a debate in Parliament. Mr. Leyenhelm says he will strenuously defend himself. The Eiffel Tower in Paris is closed for a second day because of a strike over the use of lifts. Workers say that a new access policy giving
preference to pre-booked visitors has led to three-hour queues for people buying tickets on the day. The tower's 300-strong staff welcome about 6 million visitors a year. Now, Singapore's foreign minister says Southeast Asian nations and China have reached what he described as a milestone in talks with Beijing over a code of conduct in the South China Sea that will serve as a basis for future negotiations. ASEAN foreign ministers are currently meeting in Singapore from where Karishma Vaswani sent this update. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is made up of 10 member states, and China have agreed to what the Singaporean Foreign Minister, Vivian Balakrishnan, has called a milestone in terms of an agreement. Now, what they have agreed on today is called the Code of Conduct. That's what helps ASEAN and China use to help to define how they should interact with one another in the South China Sea. Uh, what they've agreed on today is on a single draft document that frankly after years of disagreeing uh, with each other on the terms of this agreement should be seen as a relatively remarkable step. It's important to note though that we don't know what this agreement looks like, no one's seen it, and analysts that I've been talking to have said that that's probably because there's not that much in it. But the fact that ASEAN has managed to get an agreement at all is significant. Remember, this is an organization that works by consensus, so everyone has to agree on something before they can go ahead. And Singapore, as the host, is very keen to position this as a remarkable achievement. So in some senses, it's a very important step forward, but it's also not the big deal that you might think it is. It doesn't solve the main issue in the South China Sea, which is who owns what parts of it. Remember, China says it owns all of it, and this is contested by countries like the Philippines and Vietnam. Beijing is actively building runways and infrastructure and artificial islands in these contested but extremely lucrative waterways. So while it's definitely progress that they've agreed to something, all sides have agreed to something, it's hard to see what ASEAN may have had to give up in the bargain to get this agreement and what this actually means in the longer term without seeing the actual draft code of conduct. Krishma Vaswani reporting there from Singapore. Stay with us here on Impact. Still to come, we'll look at Vietnam's latest tourist attraction, a 150 meter long golden bridge. Watching Impact, I'm Yalda Hakim, and Aaron's here to tell us what's coming up on Talking Business. Yeah, busy day. It's never. Aaron, what the... happened to summer? I suppose to be quiet. Uh, well, huh? not not, huh? not quiet for you at all. <laughs> no, not Trade when you've um, not when you've got the uh, President Trump in the White House, as well as as Beijing. The war of words just continues. This is uh, we've had blackmail will not work, it'll backfire on you. That's what Beijing is telling Washington. This is after Washington now formally is going forward to look at, you know, slapping this 25% tariff on $200 billion worth of China, 6,000 products, wow. 6,000 products. So, uh, and there are many that believe out there, and so certainly many in the markets, who believe they will go ahead and do this. So that's, it's very worrying. So I'm going live to Washington to talk to an expert about that. Uh, you've been talking uh, about Google? Yes. Yeah, possibly. You know. Some will say, you want to play with the Chinese? You've got to play by, by the rules. Chinese rules, yeah. you know. And it's just that, you know, I know you've uh, been talking about it, but it's such a huge market. If, you, if you're a company that's looking to grow, you've got to look at China. China. You've absolutely yeah. got to look at China. Here's something. You remember earlier, uh, not long ago, we had Twitter, we had uh, their latest numbers, we had Facebook's latest numbers. They came out and said, hey, we're making profits. Yeah, good money. Ad sales are up. Especially for Twitter. Because Twitter, exactly. That was their down. third profit. Uh, investors turned around and went, eh, not happy. Their shares tanked. Tesla last night came out and said, guess what? We lost more money than we did last year. Double. And investors went, hoorah, their share price raced ahead. It's a company that f f feels or appears it can do no wrong. Anyway, we're, we're going live to New York to talk about that. And, you know, 75% of Brits and Americans would prefer texting over phoning. Now, companies, more and more companies, are doing initial interview jobs, interviews, texting. Texting? I, I can't get my head around it. Wow. I've got an expert in the house to talk about that. Okay. So I've got to wrap it up. Great. No problem. See ya. Aaron, thank you.
Now, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has recently uh, returned to work just six weeks after giving birth. The 38-year-old had her first child in June, becoming only the second world leader to have a baby in office. Today, she took over from her deputy, Winston Peters, a controversial veteran politician who didn't shy away from controversy during his short stint as Prime Minister. Earlier, I spoke to journalist Lloyd Burr and asked him what Jacinda Ardern might be expecting as she returns to office. Um, I think we're going to get that same old Jacinda Ardern back, um, but she's going to, I guess she'll be a bit different as well. She knows what it's like to be a mum now. Um, she's got a kid at home uh, at Premier House, which is a Prime Minister's house in New Zealand. So I think we'll see the same bubbly Jacinda Ardern, but um, we we'll, might see a few little changes, the, the stress, the tiredness. Um, she, is a, she is a formidably hard worker. She reads all the documents. So... I don't know how she's managed to fit that in the last six weeks. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if she's changed, how much she's changed, and, and what she's changed in. Now, in the meantime, uh, Winston Peters, a veteran politician, uh, took over from her role. And, you know, th there's been mixed reviews about how he did. Some say high drama, some say not as controversial as he usually would be. Yeah, he, I think he, the expectations going into his six weeks, and it was only six weeks, so it was never going to be, it's not like he was going to be the Prime Minister forever. There was a lot of scaremongering with those expectations, people saying the world's going to fall in, he's going to act like a dictator, he's going to roll out all of these big powers that he, he can as the Prime Minister, but none of that eventuated. He was a strong, steady leader. He was a bit brash sometimes. and he Because took his policies are fundamentally different to hers. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why this coalition is quite strange. I guess that's a totally different kettle of fish, and it's a discussion for another time, but they do have very different kind of uh, policies. She's very social, liberal, left-wing. He's very centrist, um, nationalistic, so uh, anti-immigrants, like, that kind exactly, of stuff. Exactly, the anti-immigrant stuff. I mean, he's, he's sort of said that, um, you know, um, a multicultural society does not represent what New Zealand really is. Yeah, the quote is fascinating, actually. He said, New Zealand should develop a unique culture that is New Zealand rather than a multitude of cultures, get this, that are like a plethora rising up like mushrooms. Um, so that, yeah, that's the kind of, and I guess that is the rhetoric, that is kind of brand Winston Peters that gets people a lot of votes, that gets him a lot of votes, gets a lot of people behind him, is this anti-immigration, we're sick of seeing all these different faces, different cultures in New Zealand, we don't want it to be a melting pot, we want it to be New Zealand, we want it to be rugby, we want it to be... Um, onion soup mix. We want it to be, you know, good old Kiwi toughness. So that's the kind of vibe that he wants, is he wants a culture for New Zealand. And, and he certainly has a fan in, in uh, the UKIP leader here, or the former UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, who described him as New Zealand's Donald Trump. You actually did that interview. Yeah, so that, that yeah, I did an interview with Nigel Farage, fascinating interview, and in which he said he really liked Winston Peters. They went out to, was it some horse racing or some... Took him uh, to cricket, he said. Yeah, that's right. They took him to cricket, that's right. Um, so, yeah, they're best buddies, but he likened him to Trump. Um, that was put to, to Winston Peters, and Winston Peters is like, no, I'm nothing like Donald Trump at all. But, but is he um, sort of seen as, as that kind of character in New Zealand? Yeah, as far as those politicians and New Zealanders who could possibly be linked to Trump, he's one of them, especially the, um, the, the, his, 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 he loves to hate the media. I don't want to call it a hatred of media because I don't think he hates the media, but he loves to hate the media. He loves winding up journalists. He loves um, pushing boundaries. He, yeah, he's pretty much, um, he, that's the thing he loves to do is winding up journalists. I've been wound up by him many times. He's been wound up by me. And when our relationship got quite tense for a while there because he sued me and he sued the Prime Minister and he sued the Deputy Prime Minister. But all this legal action which is still going on. He's been around for a very long time. He's been oh, around for decades. Absolute veteran. So he knows all the tricks in the book. And I guess that was why people were worried about what he was going to do in that six weeks, right? Because he's just so, um, he's unpredictable. He's kind of like Donald Trump in that Donald Trump is predictably unpredictable. Mm. Uh, Winston Peters kind of has a bit of a hint of that. And so I guess that's why people were a bit worried that he was going to come along and, and change New Zealand forever. New Zealand journalist Lloyd Burr there. Now let's go to the United States. The midterm elections are fast approaching and beyond them the 2020 presidential elections with the Democrats looking to stage a comeback and regain power. Several of the possible contenders to lead the party in 2020 are gathering in New Orleans including Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris. They'll be speaking at Netroots Nation, a conference bringing together thousands of progressive individuals and organizations. One of the 
Obviously, big conversations will be the future direction of the Democratic Party. To discuss this further, uh, Neil Stroker joins us from Democracy for America, Progressive Political Action Committee, which backs some of the key politicians at the conference. Neil, thank you uh, so much for joining us here on the program. Just tell us a little bit more about the purpose of this conference. Yeah, uh, the Netroots Nation Conference is probably the, the nation's largest gathering of, of the progressive movement. It's really a chance where uh, folks all across the country, an organization like Democracy for America, we're based in Burlington, but have staff uh, uh, all across the nation. I live in Detroit. Uh, this is a chance for all of us to get together. Uh, it's kind of like bringing the family together and uh, figuring out what the path forward looks for all of us uh, and uh, how we and our, and in the case of DFA, our million members across the country, uh, how they can have an impact in 2018 and, and in 2020 and, and years beyond that. Are you concerned about the path ahead or the direction that the party is taking? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, in truth, no, because uh, the writing's on the wall. Uh, the Democratic Party is going to be led in 2020 by a presidential candidate who is uh, fighting for an inclusive populist political agenda. That is hands down what will happen in 2020. What we're talking about now is, in 2018, how do we set ourselves up uh, for victory in the future presidential election? And then from there, who's going to be that voice? One of the things that's really exciting about 2020 is about the number of people that uh, will, will be able to uh, battle for this mantle of inclusive populist champion. Uh, and that's going to be pretty exciting. And actually, not just for that, but who can take on Donald Trump? Yeah. Well, and I think that's part of it. The way that Democrats are going to beat Donald Trump and the kind of hate machine that he's obstructed within the Republican Party is by bringing uh, everyone together in a mass, uh, you know, populist, uh, progressive movement. And uh, that's why we believe that the 2020 nominee for the Democratic Party is going to be an inclusive populist champion. It's just a question of who that is. But to date, we haven't really seen much leadership from the Democratic Party. Um, you know, they've they sort of talked about impeachment and they've been very critical of, of Donald Trump, but they haven't necessarily laid out an alternative policy. Well, I think what you're actually seeing in these uh, 2018 midterms is uh, inclusive populist champions at, at running for House, running for Senate, running for governor, actually putting out a really bold uh, agenda for the country. And that's one that, that's going to be built on in 2020. Just look at my home state of Michigan. We've got um, uh, a, a, a young, uh, kind of incredibly dynamic uh, candidate, Abdul Asaid, who's running for to become not only Michigan's governor, governor but the first Muslim governor in the country. Uh, he's put forward a bold agenda for uh, Medicare for all uh, within the state of Michigan, for uh, tuition-free college and a boatload of other programs that not only are important on the, on the state level in Michigan, but are important in the national level. So we're seeing those ideas come up. The question right now is whether or not the, the, the leadership in the Democratic Party in Washington gets it. And frankly, if they don't, they're going to be out soon enough. What lessons do you think uh, were learned post-2016 uh, presidential elections, just briefly? Yeah, I think the lessons that uh, we learned after 2016 was that we're not going to, the future of the party is this kind of broad, uh, inclusive populist movement, one that brings black, brown, and white progressives together uh, forward to, to victory on, on kind of an agenda that, that the American people can be inspired by. At the end of the day, we lost 2016 because millions of people sat at home and didn't think their vote mattered. 2018 and 2020 is about proving to them that it does and that it, uh, by making and putting forward some big ideas. Neil Soroka, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us here on the program. Now, fancy a stroll through a deity's hands. Vietnam has unveiled its latest tourist attraction, a 150-meter-long golden bridge perched on a mountaintop near the city of Da Nang. It's already attracted hordes of visitors since it opened in June, much to the surprise of the architect who had no idea it would attract so much attention. Have a look. Talking business coming up next. We'll be back in 30 minutes' time. See you soon.